at some point in the future, we're going to be able to, you know, synthesize everything we could possibly imagine and sequence as much as we want. So I'm interested in, you know, how do we make that future reality as quickly as possible? What are the most interesting things we can do along the way? And so my own particular uh, interest revolves around exploring uh, sequence space and developing engineering novel, particularly protein functions. And so we all know that sequence space is ridiculously large. I don't think I need to go over this in years of time, but it's extremely, you know, incomprehensibly uh, huge. And we're never going to be able to explore even a small fraction of it, no matter what technologies we develop. Nevertheless, we think about um, sequence space in a little bit more detail. We can define subsets of sequence space, um, which encompass all particular sequences that can carry out some particular function. And we can further subset that uh, for functions which exist in nature to um, the area which you know, natural um, uh, systems have already explored, and an increasingly large subset of that, which we've seen through primarily metagenomic sequencing. And so if you look at the number of proteins that we uh, have collected in metagenomic databases over time, you know, this you can see here on a, on a log plot, this has increased kind of exponentially since the advent of next generation sequencing. And we're up to now, I think about 130 million or so. But there's this huge experimental gap now in terms of what we know, um, in terms of functional characterization of each of these proteins. And you know, while bioinformatics can help us close some of that gap, there's major protein families such as receptors and transporters where you know, a single point mutation can completely alter ligand or subtree specificity. So without actually going in and doing the experimental characterization, it's very difficult to actually map out all of these um, sequence function relationships. And so in addition to that, even for sequences which have the exact same function, so here I'm showing um, the distribution in terms of percentage identity for a whole bunch of groups of orthologs with the exact same function. So even within sequences that catalyze the exact same function, there's huge diversity. and hopefully soon studying entire uh, proteomes, which are now in flux state. And so I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about two particular uh, aspects of this today, one being technological, uh, the drops in technology, which I developed in my postdoc and um, a secondary like analysis um, pipeline that we developed. So if we go back to this idea of sequence space and we zoom in on this, uh, on this space we've seen and we have in uh, metagenomic databases, we can choose a whole bunch of different divergent um, sequences if we want to explore some particular functionality. And so the way we're going to do that, you know, as most of us in this room do, is by synthesizing a whole bunch of DNA variants, DNA hypotheses, and in, which are encoded on, on DNA molecules, and go in and do some functional testing. And so if you're dealing with proteins, one of the major, challenging, one of the major challenges is length. Right? So if we think about what kind of library diversity we can achieve versus you know, the, the lengths of the corresponding sequences, we have a number of different technologies that we can kind of leverage. The first and most oldest, of course, being just mutagenesis. We can just take a gene and randomly or um, on specifically introduce mutations. Um, and that's extremely powerful, but um, the resulting library diversity is extremely low. So you tend to only explore the local landscape around your particular template that you're mutating. You know, oligos to all of us have been, you know, revolutionary in that we've been able to encode pretty much anything we could possibly want, as long as it fits in about two, now maybe 300 base pairs, right? So that's been the primary limiting factor. They're extremely low cost, so we can get to hundreds of thousands. Um, they do suffer from errors, um, but, you know, that's something we can live with uh, since the advent of NGS. And so if you want to go to, you know, much, uh, much more diverse libraries that are longer length. We have a couple of different um, possibilities. We can use PCR that doesn't really scale well. And you know, if you've got organisms that live, you know, in Antarctica or at the bottom of the lake, it's going to be a bit hard to access your actual template. Um, and we've also got gene synthesis, which is kind of this umbrella term for taking all these low-cost oligos and stitching them together into much longer fragments. Unfortunately, up to now, these kind of suffer from a high cost per variant. So unless you have a massive budget it's gonna be really hard for you to access really scales that are kind of game changing. And so in my postdoc, I worked on this technology which we call DropSynth, which essentially takes the low cost oligos and assembles them together into incre uh, increasingly longer length fragments. And we're pushing up to uh, about 1KB now. And so how does this work? 
So this is the gene library that we want to design. If we zoom in on one particular gene, we go in, we bioinformatically split each of these genes to have overlapping sequences. And then you could ask, okay, so you know, we can just um, put all of these um, fragments together. You know, we order an oligo pool and slap them into uh, PCA. Well, the problem is without isolating each of the oligos necessary to assemble some particular gene, there's enough cross hybridization that this, this basically just fails. So you need some sort of technique to isolate only the oligos you needed to assemble some particular sequence. And the way we do that is by barcoding. So each of the fragments go into the payload section of an oligo and all of the oligos, sorry, all of the oligos necessary to assemble some particular gene are, um, are given a unique barcode. That barcode, we then go in and process that and expose that microbead barcode as a single stranded overhang in such a way that it allows us to pull it down. We do this in, in many, many different oligos simultaneously, pull them down on the surface of barcoded beads, which have been made in such a way that each bead contains only one particular barcode type on the surface. So you can imagine that each of these beads is pulling down only the oligos necessary to create some particular construct. We can make as many of these beads um, you know, as is realistically feasible. And so what we do is we hybridize, uh, we load each of these microbeads and we wash away all of the unhybridized constructs. And then we go in and we do a very simple vortex-based uh, water and oil emulsion. And we put each of these beads, uh, they're Poisson loaded uh, into a droplet, isolating them from each of the other beads. Once they're inside the beads, we use a temperature sensitive restriction enzyme to basically cleave the payloads off the surface and we do a PCA within the, each of the droplets to essentially um, synthesize or assemble our entire gene. This is done in parallel in millions of droplets simultaneously. Um, and after assembly, we basically just break the emulsion and recover our original design library. And so this entire process um, takes about, uh, and then we go in and actually uh, uniquely barcode each of the resulting molecules. So this entire process shown here basically takes about one to two weeks. Um, and uh, at the moment costs about less than $1 per gene for lengths of about um, five to 700 base pairs. And so um, let me tell you a little thing, uh, a few properties of the characteristics of the resulting libraries. What you're seeing here are each of these dots represents a library of 384 genes. And what you're showing um, on the right side is essentially the percentage coverage. So for each of these proteins, how often did we see um, the perfect synthesis, uh, the perfect sequence assembled um, for each of these genes? And you can see the typical coverage for each of these libraries is roughly around 70%. We're working on ways of getting that up. Um, since the initial work, we've, we've released a preprint, which is, uh, which is on BioArchive, where we can now assemble within a single tube um, 1536 genes. And there's no reason to think that we can't scale that up uh, even further. But at this point, you know, um, it's relatively easy to assemble, you know, if you have the money, um, 40, even potentially 50,000 genes in a single week, um, if that's what you want to do. And so by, uh, by even synthesizing each protein in multiple codon versions and combining the resulting one, you can then further increase your library coverage up to about uh, over 80%. And so um, in terms of how many of these, um, how many of the resulting molecules are actually perfect, um, we are kind of hovering with the latest uh, optimizations in the 20 to 30% range. And what I mean by this is if you were to isolate one of these droplets and look at all of the molecules inside this, if you just look at 100 of the molecules for one particular gene, so on average, about 25% of those molecules actually have the sequence that you intended, that you designed for. And the rest are either um, deletions, primarily due to the oligo process, synthesis process itself, or um, mutations that you've introduced during the process. And so uh, I don't need to get into this much, but you know, classically, we've always done you know, a single hypothesis for test tube. Multiplexing has really allowed us to switch over to you know, many hundreds of thousands of variants per, uh, per test tube using barcodes to do NGS readouts. And so we're gonna couple these libraries into these, uh, into these multiplex assays. And as a proof of concept, since I'm kind of limited in time today, I'm gonna talk about um, one protein family, uh, PPAT, which is um, an enzyme found in all living creatures in the uh, coenzyme A biosynthesis pathway. And what's interesting about this particular enzyme is that the bacterial versions have extremely low homology to 
the, to their mammalian counterparts. So it's interesting development for uh, potentially antibiotics. And so without going into my, too much detail, you synthesize 1,200 variants. Uh, we made a relatively simple assay where we introduced a native gene onto a heat curable rescue plasmid. We introduced the library, and then we basically saw when we cured the plasmid, what kind of enrichment and depletion of the barcodes do we get and calculate some sort of fitness scores. And it's reproducible. Oh, there we go. So you see E. coli up there. Uh, naively going into this, we expected that um, all of the uh, orthologs relatively close to E. coli are going to be able to complement really well because they're evolutionarily close. And as you got farther and farther away, they're going to have increasingly uh, larger trouble. And so that's not what we saw at all. And so the two take home points from this plot of being that um, red and orange sequences complement very well and the black sequences basically drop out of the population is that over 70% of the, the homologs taken throughout the entire phylogenetic tree were able to complement this fine. And the ones which dropped out are not really clustered into clades at all. So, right? so they're just dispersed throughout the entire tree. And so this kind of sent us down the rabbit hole of a whole bunch of different experiments and um, um, to try to figure out what is actually going on here. And so that um, brings me to the kind of the second part of what I want to talk about was that um, if you didn't think deep mutational scanning was hard enough, we wanted to make it even harder by using um, this fact. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of errors in our, in our libraries. And so in the initial um, implementation of DropSynth, a lot of these errors were low distance away from your design variant. And you can think of these as a, as a very shallow mutational scan around each of your points. And so yeah, the rest of them being train shifts primarily due to dilutions, but about 30% of the data is actually usable mutations. And so you can imagine, we previously had explored sequence space like this, and now we're gonna explore local space as well around each of the design variants. And so um, to make a long story short, um, we're primarily used to these heat maps from deep mutational scanning where we have um, the, the potential fitness score for every amino acid at every position. We've now added another dimension onto this where we've taken all of these uh, home logs and then we've aligned them together and then we put that in as, as another dimension. And so I do want to say that I think alignment um, does remove a lot of very interesting functionally competent solutions that you know, don't align very well. So we have to kind of discard those for now until we have better ways to analyze it. Nevertheless, we're able to do two interesting things with this. So we're able to split this into two. The first being a, a loss of function matrix. So we looked at the sequences which complemented and which had mutations which primarily caused loss, loss of function. And for those, yeah, we, we took only high fitness homologs and we collapsed along the homolog dimension. We took each point by point and we basically could build um, build it up column by column, row by row, and build heat maps like this. And so unlike uh, deep mutational scanning heat map, each of these points represent the, the impact of this amino acid at that aligned position collapsed onto the reference E. coli for many, many, many different context backgrounds that all catalyze the exact same function. Uh, and so without going into this in too much detail, we see um, the traditional, you know, um, conserved uh, highly constrained mutations around the catalytic site and very interestingly uh, very promiscuous regions around certain other regions which are um, in at least E. coli known to interact with some of the substrates. And so I don't have time to jump into this in too much detail but we can further subset this and you know jump into the into the 3D matrix a lot more and we can divide that into um, different types of mutations and so each of these points is showing essentially um, the mutation listed on the bottom at that aligned position on a different orthologue background. And so you see that we can divide, divide them into primarily loss of function mutations. So no matter what the rest of your sequence is, you know, you're getting a loss of function primarily at highly conserved sites, neutral mutations. And by far the most interesting is these highly variable mutations. So depending on what the rest of the context is, it could be gain or loss of function or completely neutral, which are extremely hard to predict a priori from sequence alone. Um, and so I think an even more interesting in my limited time now is uh, looking at the gain of function matrix. So what we did there was we took the homologs which are not able to complement at all and we asked, can we find any mutants for them which actually restore function? And um, if you collapse it along the two dimensions, indeed we did, we saw um, gain of function mutations actually clustered at eight, muta uh, at eight positions along the surface of the protein. And it turns out that um, those mutations actually clustered if you project them onto the, 
um, onto the structure, including in distant uh, beta strands, which kind of pointed to um, an actual functional uh, interpretation of, of this, which given other um, experiments which I don't have time to talk about, uh, led us to believe that primarily the dropouts are being caused by protein-protein interactions, which given the fact that we've taken these enzymes from other organisms have not been evolutionarily screened against when we plug them into E. coli, uh, among other issues. Um, and so, yeah, this work was done in uh, the Kasuri lab when I was a postdoc. I'd like to thank um, Angus, who helped me a lot, um, and Nate as well with, uh, with bioinformatics. I've now got my own lab at the University of Oregon, and I'm recruiting at all levels. And if you're a postdoc interested in uh, tenure track positions, we're opening up dozens um, at the Knight campus, so come talk to me. Uh, yeah, lots of research topics. Happy to take your questions. Uh, there's a workshop tomorrow if you're interested in more nitty-gritty details, which I conveniently neglected to mention today. Yeah.